Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Joanne Cho, and I'm the choir and vocal instructor at Rio Hondo College. We are so excited today to have Dr. Jonathan Talberg as our guest today. Dr. Talberg serves as the director of choral activities at the Bob Cole Conservatory at Cal State Long Beach. He is a conductor of the international award-winning Bob Cole Conservatory Chamber Choir. Recent career highlights include 
leading the chamber choir to first place awards at the Spittle International Choir Festival in 2017 and the Choir of the World Competition in Wales in 2016. Additionally, he and the choir have performed with groups as diverse as the Kronos Quartet, the Los Angeles Master Chorale, the Pacific Symphony, and the Rolling Stones. A passionate advocate for choral music education, Dr. Talbert is regularly engaged to conduct honor choirs across the U.S., including numerous all-state courses and National Association for Music Education Conference choirs. I first met Dr. Talbert exactly a year ago at the Western Region ACDA Conference. I attended his workshop called Words, 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 where he talked about analyzing and interpreting poetic texts in music for expressive emotional music making. And he had his award-winning choir with him to demonstrate for us. I learned so much and was so inspired by not only the content, but the way he delivered it with so much passion and clarity. So thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Talbert. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cho. It's great to see you again and <laughs> so nice to be with all of you. Now, our students uh, have prepared some questions for you. Um, for our guests joining from other schools in our community, um, I want to thank you, first of all, for joining us. And please feel free to um, type your questions in the chat and we'll try to get um, to them, by, uh, to, to get to all of them. So without further ado, um, Timothy, is Timothy here? He's going to ask the first question for Dr. Talbert. Great. Timothy, oh, there you are. Okay, so make sure you unmute yourself and everyone else mute yourselves. Uh, yes. Um, my question was that, uh, is there any other like profession that requires music? So, like, like such as like music therapy? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess any profession that has the name music in it would definitely require music. So music therapy, music production, uh, music teacher, uh, music professor, professional musician. If, if, if there's any use of that word, absolutely. But I, I would go further and say that being a musician allows you so many possibilities for careers. Um, I, I have former students of mine who are lawyers, who are surgeons, who are voice doctors, who are airplane pilots, um, former students who are car mechanics, former students who, lots of them who are elementary, middle school, high school, and college professors, um, and who work in retail. I have one, he finished a degree in voice and he just went and did his barber certificate to become a barber because he wanted to have something real steady a long time. He loves seeing classical music, but you know, being a professional singer and making all of your living as a singer is hard. But if you can be a barber during the day and then go to rehearsals in the evening, man, that, that's a great way to make a living. So I would say that there are so many different ways that, that we can use music as, as part of our careers or that we can just get an education in music and then um, go off and do a career in something else that, that maybe pays the bills. Um, but yeah, there, I, I think studying music is a great course of action for yeah, a exactly. meaningful, joyful life. No! I would say. Okay, I'll tell you on my phone because you're on my computer. Fine. Does that answer your question, Timothy? Yes, yes. Great. Okay, so please remember to uh, mute yourselves unless you're asking a question. Um, the next question, Alex, Alex Vasquez. Hello, Dr. Talbert. It's an honor to meet you. Hi, Alex. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah, I, I know you're very, uh, you're very, you're one of the, um, the most, I know you're one of the most sought after choral directors in the, in the country, because I've been listening to some of your stuff and I was like, I never really particularly listened to choral music and things like that. But when I listened to your stuff, I was like, it's oh, nice, amazing. Nice. Well, like, this is what I want to hear when I'm listening to these groups perform, you know? And um, so my question for you is, uh, how long were you studying music when you finally realized that the particular path you're, you're on that you took, that, that you wanted to take that path? Uh, yeah, that, that's a really great question. So I um, the answer to that question is one week of college. Um, so I, 
and and it's kind of a fun story, which I'll tell you guys. But first, I think it's important to say that I I did play music. I'm actually zooming you guys from my mom's house. Um, my my mom is recovering from some surgery, and so I'm here. This is the piano that I grew up playing right behind me. I happen to love this instrument um, just because it's my it's my childhood piano, um, and and this is the house that I grew up in. I started taking piano lessons when I was 12, which is old, really, if you want to be a truly great pianist. Um, but it's a good age if you want to be a really functional pianist, and um, and I am a very functional pianist. Um, and I started taking voice lessons when I was 16 because I was doing a lot of musical theater and I was losing my voice, so I started to take voice lessons for function, for actually being able to sing healthy and well and um, and it worked for that I got into college as a theater arts major and I and I started in theater at Pepperdine University um, in Malibu um, and I was very fortunate and kind of miraculous that the professor of choral music at Pepperdine was a man named Roger Wagner now most of you guys will have never heard the name Roger Wagner but he founded the Los Angeles Master Chorale and he had a group called the Roger Wagner Chorale, um, which did most of the Broadway, or, sorry, most of the Hollywood soundtracks for movies from about 1940 until The Hunt for Red October, which is like 1993 or something. So basically over 50 years, he recorded all of the choral soundtracks in Hollywood. And he had been professor of music at UCLA and retired from UCLA. And then Pepperdine hired him to, to come and just teach choir at Pepperdine. And, and they got him to do it because he was bored. He loved being a choral musician and he was retired and he didn't have enough to keep himself busy. So he, he retired. Um, and then he went back to work at Pepperdine. Well, anyway, I auditioned for the choir and I, I got in. And after the first rehearsal of my freshman year, he looked at me, I was in the front row, and he said, hey, you come talk to me. And I was kind of shocked, right? And after rehearsal, I was kind of scared. And I, and I, and I walked over to him. I said, yes, Dr. Wagner, what, 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 what can I do for you? He said, well, what's your major? And I said, it's theater arts. I, I, I'm, I'm an actor and I want, to do, I want to be a professional actor. And he looks at me and he said, well, that's stupid. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> and he said, I mean, I don't mean you any disrespect, but it's stupid. He's like, actors are miserable people. He said, I've lived in Hollywood my whole life. Actors are really, really miserable people. You know who are happy people? Music teachers. He said, you're a wonderful musician. I love having you in choir. It's clear that you are paying attention to everything I do and you write everything down. He said, you're a good sight reader. You have good musicianship skills. And I was, and I did. I was, like I said, I was blessed to start playing piano when I was young. Um, so that was the first week of school. He said, why don't you come to my office tomorrow and we'll talk about it. I'll just give you a lesson on conducting. We'll just talk about what a conductor does and, and how a conductor um, lives their, you know, learns their music and all that sort of stuff. So I went to his office the next day. And by that Friday, I changed my major to music. And um, so it really was, I, when I say it took me one week to make a decision, but it was because of great mentor, mentorship, Alex. It was because someone said to me, you know what? And he was really honest. He said, you're short, you're brown, you're not, you have a beautiful leading Broadway voice. But this was 1987, guys. There were no Broadway, there were no short Jewish Broadway actors singing romantic male leads at that point. Um, and there wasn't this idea yet that you could be anything but the standard six foot two blonde guy, you know, and be a curly in Oklahoma. And that's changed fortunately, and people get cast for their beautiful voices and good acting skills. But I've been grateful ever since. I think he gave me spectacular advice. And, um, and I love my career. I love my life. Now, this year has sucked. I mean, to be honest, the, I don't love Zoom choir any more than you guys love Zoom choir. And I don't like teaching on Zoom. But I know that we're coming to the light at the end of the tunnel. And it's no longer a pinpoint. It's a it's a big, bright light and that by fall of next year, we'll be studying and we'll be singing again. Um, and so I love my career and I'm really grateful for that advice early, early on. Thank, thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. That, that, that helped a lot. <laughs> Mitsumi? Sure yes, hello. Hi. Um. So my question was like, um, what does it take 
to conduct like at your level like what what are the hoops you need to jump through to get to where you are well i think there's two there's two things to think about to, to be at my level. First is you have to have the skills as a conductor. So you have to have studied a lot of music and you have to know a lot of repertoire and you have to have good ears. You have to have spent a lot of time, you know, listening and, and, and playing music and singing through music. Um, you have to have the experience. Also, I'll quote Roger Wagner again. Um, you have to have the experience to know what you want to hear and know how to get it because that's really what a conductor does, is they, they, they study the score until they know exactly how the score is supposed to sound. And the way that that score is supposed to sound is in their ears, in their, in their mind's eye. So I audiate the sound. And once I know what it's supposed to sound like, then I can make the choir sing that way. But that takes the second part, which is you have to have great musicians in front of you. I'm lucky that, that Bob Cole Conservatory of Music is the only you know, state, fully state-supported conservatory of music in California. And so we have great singers, not just good singers, but great singers at Bob Cole. So because of that, I'm able to work with a really high quality instrument quite frankly. And so between my skills as a conductor and the group's skills as singers, we can put those two things together and come out with something really, really special. Ultimately, like I said, you have to know what you want to hear and you have to know how to get it. And one of the things that I have learned over the years about how to get it is that I have to recruit and support and train the finest young musicians that I can get to come to Cal State Long Beach. Um, and we have a tremendous amount to offer at Long Beach State. So we get them. We get lots of great students. What's next? Um, next is uh, Martha. Um, hi, Dr. Talbert. How are you today? I'm good, Martha. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question for you. Um, how did you grow your program to be the prestigious program that it is today? Um, it's a lot of sweat and a lot of tears and a lot of years of work. Um, so when I came to Long Beach State, it was in really bad trouble. The, the teacher who had been there had um, passed away. Well, she was sick still when I got the job. She passed away my first year, um, but she had had cancer. She was a much beloved choral director named Lynn Bielefeldt. Um, and, and, a, and a spectacular musician, but she had had no energy because she had had three different bouts of cancer and she had had no energy to do any recruiting or to take the choir on tour or to do the kind of thing that you need to do. So when I started in Long Beach, um, there, my first auditions, we had 11 people audition for, for the program as voice majors, as music education majors, and as Bachelor of Arts in Music. Um, and to give you an example, in a normal year, like say last year, I'm not talking about COVID, but in a normal year now, we'll have about 200 people audition. So we went from 11 auditioning to 200 auditioning to get in. Um, I, I think you have to have an image of what you want the program to be. It's like everything else in life. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you to where you're don't know what you're doing. I knew what I wanted. I wanted to have a program where young singers could come and experience great choral music, great jazz, great opera, and first class voice teaching. And I was in a position because the program was at basically at zero when I got there, that I was able to build those things. I was able to hire the voice faculty that I wanted, um, which was which is really important. I was able to hire the adjunct faculty that I, that I wanted in, in jazz and in jazz voice and in opera. So in my first five to 10 years, I hired all this faculty that was real, that were really spectacular people, really talented, well-trained, thoughtful, and kind. And I think that that's part of it is I wanted a culture where people felt supported and loved, not like where I had gone to school. Um, I, I didn't feel that way as an undergrad. Um, except for, for from Roger at Pepperdine and, and then from some of my teachers at Chapman. But I didn't have a good experience as an undergrad. And, and I knew it, it was because I felt judged for being a musical theater singer. I felt, you know, I, I, there, there were just a lot of judgments made about the kind of music that I liked, the kind of music I wanted to sing. Um, and I, I wasn't taught that, that, there, that music can be different and that there's different cultural musics that we love, but that there's beauty in all musics. 
And so I wanted to bring that to Long Beach. I wanted jazz to be a part of what people did if they wanted to. And I wanted opera to be a part of what people did. But I didn't want to force the people who wanted to do jazz to do opera. And I didn't want to force the opera people to do jazz. So by giving people choice to let their strengths go where they needed to go, we really have been able to attract um, really well-rounded singers. And it's perfect for someone who says, you know, I love to sing, man. I love to sing jazz, but I want to be in an opera. And I want to do a vocal recital, and I want to do master classes with LA opera with LA opera singers, you know, and Grant Gershon and all these people that we can get in to do master classes. So, with that in mind, um, I set out to create that program, and um, and then I I would say that I got lucky. I, I was at the right school. Um, the administration really liked me. Um, they liked my ideas, and they supported me, and gave me money to spend on my students, and supported tours. And um, bit by bit, we kept building this reputation. And, and I'm a hard worker, so I, I also did the, the um, kind of the nonprofit route along with my work at, at Long Beach. I was really active in the American Choral Directors Association in California. I, I became president um, over a 12-year period. So I mean, I was, I was the university chair. I, I was the um, chair of college, um, college youth groups. I became the vice president and the president and past president. So I spent a long time doing that thing also. But, um, you know, I think it's just about loving what you do and working towards a goal that really, and that doesn't matter whether it's music or dance or theater or basketball. If you love what you do, you got to shoot 10,000 baskets before you can do it well, you know? And so I always say it, it, it takes that kind of commitment to, to be successful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, next, we have Samantha. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, Samantha. Nice to see you. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, what does it take to be in your, choir in your choirs in Cal State LA, like when awards travel the world, work with big shots like the Rolling Stones and the, and the LA Master Choral? Uh-huh. Well, first, I just got to remind you, I'm not at Cal State LA. I'm at Cal State Long Beach. So oh, sorry. <laughs> my colleague, Christopher Gravis, is a wonderful conductor, and he's the conductor at Cal State LA. But um, I'm at the conservatory at Cal State Long Beach. Um, what does it take to get in the choir? Well, I can tell you this. You have to be a really wonderful musician. You have to have a beautiful voice. And everybody in my choir is a wonderful musician and has a beautiful voice. And so those are two things that are interrelated frequently, but sometimes are not. There are people who have gorgeous, beautiful singing voices who don't read music. And if they don't read music, they can't sing in the Bob Cole Chamber Choir because we do too much music and we do too much difficult music. Um, Dr. Cho was talking about the music that I demonstrated at the American Choral Directors Association conference last year. So we performed three pieces at the conference that we rehearsed once before we got there. And those were those three pieces for that conference choir. We sang through them just because I wanted them to be raw, because I wanted to be able to show, demonstrate, this is how we would rehearse this. And so the singers who are in the group are really good sight readers. Now, that means that, that they work hard in their musicianship classes. Some of them play piano, but they don't all play piano. Um, but all of them have, have really reached um, the end of the kind of the, the musicianship course at Cal State Long Beach. My chamber choir is usually made up of transfer students. It's mostly transfer students and then upper division students who started at Long Beach State. So I would say it's about 75% transfer students usually. And they've got to be willing to give a lot of time. Um, you know, we do a lot of touring. We do a lot of extra rehearsals. We go on two retreats a year. It's super fun. I mean, we go up to the mountains um, and and we learn a bunch of music and we cook together and we have a big party and then we do it again in the snow in the winter time. Um, so it's, it's a great chance to get to know each other. And um, so it's about commitment and, and they have to be nice people. Um, I really do. I really do screen the people that we work with. Culture is really important to me and I want to work with kind, loving, hardworking people. We don't, I don't want to work with divas. I want to work with divas vocally. They need to, they need to have a diva of a voice, but they can't have a diva attitude. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, that's amazing. Um, next we have Darian. 
Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you doing, Darian? Pretty good. Pretty good. good. Um, so I have a, I have a two-parter for you. Okay. Um, so are there any unique coral or vocal techniques that you use? And the second part is what methods do you use to create the sound that you want uh, from your choirs? I guess they are two separate things, but they're, they're really interconnected. Um, so let's start with the sound. What do I use to create the sound? Um, I am a great believer that a singer should bring everything they do in their voice lessons and in the voice studio into choir. And so I'm not looking to constrict the natural instrument that people bring. And so because of that, my choir is different every year. It sounds different. Some schools, you can hear it and you can be like, that's that conductor. I know it's that conductor. His choirs always sound the same or her choirs always sound the same. That's not true at Long Beach State because I build my choir's sound around the voices that are in there. And I think that blend, which is something we talk about a lot in choir, um, blend is built by finding the right people to stand next to who blend beautifully together. Not by saying, hey, Darian, you sing less and Isabel, you sing more. And Martha, maybe you could fix your vowel on the ah. And Maya, um, I need a little bit higher if, you know, resonance. Maybe I have to do those things too. But generally, it's about moving people around and, and finding musicians with beautiful voices and encouraging them to sing with their full body so that there's a real sense of connection to the sound. Um, and that doesn't mean that we don't sing differently. For example, last year we did this big Eric Whitaker piece um, that's an hour long. And um, we did that for the same conference that we were talking about in Salt Lake City. And, um, you know, the sopranos do a lot of hanging out in straight tone land. They, they cannot vibrate or messes up those Eric Whitaker chords. But they have to do it health, healthfully. And so we have to find as a group what's the healthiest way to make that happen. Um, so I would say that one of, one of the things that is specific to my teaching, at least from what I have seen with other colleagues, is I will let the choir sing too loud while they're learning a piece so that they're really getting it into their bodies and getting it into their voices and they're just comfortable. I say, give me your shower mezzo forte. And by that, I mean, like, if you're in the shower and you're washing your hair and you're just going, Va pensiero sulla lidorate. That's, that's my mezzo forte. That's my comfortable, warm singing. So we start with that kind of sound. And from there, we sculpt it. You know, when Michelangelo went to make David, the great, the great statue of David, he didn't take little pieces of marble and stick them together and keep putting pieces of marble until he finally made a body. He had a giant piece of marble and he chipped away at it. So I start with a big sound. I start with a big, full-bodied, warm sound, and then I sculpt it from there. Um, the other thing that I, that I do, I think, pretty well and maybe differently than some people is um, I focus on poetry. And I mean really focus on poetry. Before we sing a piece, we read the poem. We talk about the poem. People take out their phones and we define words that we don't understand. We talk about the period that the poet lived. I mean, if this poem was written in 1920 in France, it's influenced by World War I. So what is World War I? And what was France's role in World War I? And et cetera, et cetera. So we try to contextualize the poetry before we even sing the music. Because in choral music, music almost always comes from poetry. The poem is first, and then the music comes afterwards. And I think, unfortunately, though, a lot of us forget that. We forget that the poem comes first. Yeah. So I think those are two things that I really focus on, Darian. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Isabel Lopez. Hello, Dr. Talberg. It's such a pleasure to have you at our school with us. Thank you so much for coming today. It's so fun to be here in my mom's living room and at your school at the same time. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what I wanted to ask you is, um, so what do you feel during a performance? Um, do you concentrate on the music itself or do you find yourself just focusing on the emotions? Like what's going on when you're performing? First of all, let me tell you, no one has ever asked me that question. In Ooh, all, nice. And all the times that I've done, and actually um, Dr. Cho sent me a, a list of the questions and I got this question, I'm like, tasty. That is a tasty question that no one has ever asked me. 
um, I mentioned to you that I started started college as an acting major, um, and even though I changed my music, I changed my my major to music. Um, I still had an acting minor, and I continued that acting minor, and I started a master's degree in theater actually because I was teaching music and theater at the high school at a high school, um, and I just wanted to study more theater. I am an actor, and that's a part of who I am. I've done a ton of shows in my life. Um, and so if there's one thing I know about acting, it's that it's only believable when it's in the moment. And that means that you are hearing what people are saying and you're responding in real time with your own emotions and your own feelings. So that being said, when I am conducting a piece, I am not thinking, altos come in on beat two of the next bar. Um, tenors, you're gonna have to you know, really open up the space to sing that high A flat. Basses, I need you to growl down there. Those thoughts never happen to me in performance. That work is done in rehearsal. And in rehearsal, I teach all those things. In performance, I hope that I'm leading a musical slash spiritual in our best day performance so that my students are really singing from their hearts. And that's about preparation. That's about my knowing the music so much that I don't have to think about the altos coming in on beat four of the next bar. It's just in my gesture and I'm gonna bring them in naturally. But what I'm really thinking about is how does this piece make me feel? And how do I want my choir to feel? And ultimately, how do I want the audience to feel? You know, I think we don't think about the term conductor very much. In science, a conductor is something that takes energy from one place to another. Wire is a very good conductor, right? Uh, copper wire takes energy from the, from the electric plants down on Studebaker um, and 2nd Street, right up, right up the 605 to your houses. And that energy then goes to your computer and your phone and, and your refrigerator, all that sort of stuff. A conductor takes energy from a composer, takes that energy to his ensemble, and then the ensemble takes that energy out to the audience. And so I think that my role, my role as a conductor is to, is to turn that energy into something emotional, turn that energy into something artistic and spiritual. And ultimately, when I do my work the best that I can do it, I think that's the goal. That's a very beautiful answer. Thank you so much. You're also, welcome. may I say, as a former theater arts major myself, your story with Dr. Wagner really resonated with me. So thank you for sharing that as well. You're welcome. You're welcome. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, next, we have Chantel. Hi. Good Hi. afternoon. Nice to yeah. see you. Uh, nice to see you. I just have two questions. Um, one of them is, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences when you um, travel like with your choirs? And then another one, do you have like a favorite place to perform? Okay, two, two, two questions. Let me go backwards again. Sometimes I, like, sometimes I think I like your second questions better than your first questions. Um, do I have a favorite place to perform? My favorite place to perform by definition in my career has to be wherever I'm performing next. And, and think about that. It, if I'm not in love with the next venue, then, then I can't give it everything I want. So I know intellectually that my favorite place to perform has to be the next performance that I had. That being said, I had an extraordinary experience in 2008 and we were invited to do um, a private recital in the Sistine Chapel. And if you know the Sistine Chapel, it's in, it's in Rome, in the center of the Vatican. It's where they go to choose the popes, and it's where the ceiling was painted by Michelangelo on his back for six years. Um, and so it, it's, it's right, I, I, like, I like to say, so I looked up at the ceiling and I found the spot where God was reaching his finger out to David and I stood myself right there and I said to the singers, you guys will be right there and we'll ask them to put the audience over there. And so <clears throat> I am aware that there's only one spot in the world where Michelangelo painted the ceiling. And that when you get the opportunity to make music of geniuses in a space designed by geniuses, 
that that's something that's only going to probably happen in my life one time. And so for me, if I were to look at, at my whole career and all the beautiful places that I've conducted, I think that has to be the one, the one spot where I say, that's my singularly most cherished memory. We finished that concert and my students just broke into tears. They just started to cry. And I don't mean kind of cry. I mean like six foot three bases on their knees crying because the space is so beautiful and, and to sing in there is so special. Um, and it was so unexpected. I've been able to conduct on the Great Wall of China. That was an unbelievable experience. 300 singers on the Great Wall of China. I've conducted in Carnegie Hall. I've conducted in the Walt Disney Concert Hall. How do you rank these experiences? I think you just say thank you. I think the right answer is gratitude and to say, man, I, I have worked hard and I have been blessed for working hard. Um, and, you know, to, to be able to conduct you know, in, in the temple of music that is that is the Walt Disney Concert Hall is amazing. Or the Renee and Henry Sagerstrom Concert Hall in, in Orange County, actually I like better in terms of acoustics for a choir. Um, I mean, Walt Disney Concert Hall is so beautiful and I love hearing orchestras. And I love hearing the master crowd there. It's just astonishing. Um, but from a singer's perspective, there's something really special about what they call a shoebox, which is, you know, think of how a shoebox is long, long, if you put a choir on one side, the sound goes out, circles around and comes back. And that's that's the, that hall in Orange County. And so that that's a really special place to conduct and to sing. I've been lucky enough to, to sing in there as well. Um, I mean, I can answer, I could just keep answering this question and telling you so many beautiful places that I've conducted, but the one is the Sistine Chapel, no doubt, no doubt. Wow, thank you. That's so awesome to know. You're welcome. What was your first question? I got all excited about this one. <laughs> um, my first question, it was, um, sorry. So I think you kind of said, I just wanted to know like a little bit about like your experiences traveling with your choirs, but you kind of gave me an idea of, you know, well, how it is. Let me just tell you that the better you know music and the better you know the people you make music with, the better the music is going to be. And so the beautiful thing about tours is you sing the same, sing the same music sometimes every night for two weeks, um, you know. And when you do the same piece, you try to do it differently. That's one thing a conductor does is we will change things up just to keep it fresh. Maybe one section is going to be a little bit softer, a little bit faster, or a little bit um, more showy. I don't know. But as singers get to learn it with, and they really internalize it, tours are really, really special. Um, I'm finishing our uh, editing our album right now um, that we recorded in King's Chapel in London, King's College Chapel in London um, three years ago. I didn't know how much, I was just naive, I didn't know how much goes into a great choral album. And so when I came back, it kind of just went on the shelf until I found the right engineer to do it. And going back and listening to how good my choir was after two weeks on the road in Germany and Austria, and then landing in London to record an album is just amazing. It's like, wow, there's so much detail and finesse in their singing. That's because they've been singing that repertoire every night for two and a half weeks. And it really makes a difference. So that part of touring is great. Then of course, you know, there's being on a bus with people and being on an airplane and extraordinary meals and sightseeing. You know, we had a chance to sing at, at, at Stonehenge on that tour and actually sing in front of these stones. It was amazing. And of course there's parties. I, you know, I, I, I'm a college professor. My student, my students want to go out and go to, go to the bars. So that's part of the tour. It's built in when we're in Europe um, and really, really fun. So uh, touring is just amazing. It's just spectacular. It's a great part of being, being in a choir, whether it's an amateur choir or a collegiate choir or a pro choir, everybody loves to tour. Wow. That's so awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next we have Sarah. Hello, nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you, Sarah. Um, since you were talking about like touring at like all these places, um, does a professional like yourself ever experience stage fright still? No. No? No. I, I think you experience the excitement of a live performance. But I think stage fright is something that you get over in that term. Mm -hmm. Little anxiety, 
little nerves maybe if the group's not quite ready. Um, appreciation for what an honor it is. You know, when I'm, as a conductor, sitting in Leonard Bernstein's uh, dressing room at Carnegie Hall, getting ready to go on stage and, and conduct a professional orchestra on a choir of 200 people, I know how much is resting on my doing the right thing at the right time. Mm -hmm. I can't focus on that. I have to focus on the music. I have to focus on how do I make this music beautiful and how do I conduct the energy of this score through that ensemble to the audience behind me. So it doesn't really leave me time for stage fright, but it does leave me time for what I would say is a little pre-concert jitters. Yeah, um, yeah. And you know, I think I say to the choir, if you don't feel a little nervous before a big concert, you're not alive, mm -hmm. right? Being, being alive, that, that's what, you know, we, we love live music because there is always the possibility something can go wrong. But I've also been doing it long enough that I've had things go wrong. And I know that it's not the end of the world to go, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really sorry. We're gonna start that again. Boom. Mm -hmm. And I've done that and it's fine. It's not the end of the world. And once you realize that nobody's gonna die, you know, you know, my mom, my mom introduced me once as her son, the doctor, but not the kind that helps people. <laughs> and I, I laugh at that, but, um, what, what it makes me think is like, uh, okay, nobody's going to die if I give a bad cue. So that keeps the stage right down. Wow, that's really interesting. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind next time I'm nervous. <laughs> yeah, take a deep breath and think about how lucky you are to be doing what you're doing. Gratitude is the great, is, is really like the great balm. Gratitude and grace. Forgive yourself for being nervous. Yeah, I'm just human. <laughs> give yourself some grace. Thank you. Oh, this is just so inspiring. Okay, I wish we had like all day. Okay, so we're gonna keep going <laughs> um, to get to all of the questions. Yesenia is next. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Talbert. Hi, um, I would just like to say thank you for sharing some of your time for us, towards us. All of your answers have been very informative and very helpful. And um, second of all, I would like to like continue with my question. Um, it's what kind of techniques and practices um, would you recommend for students just starting out? Starting out as a singer or as a conductor, Yesenia? Um, both. Okay. Well, I think it's the same, to be honest. I think you've got to you gotta be okay with the slow work of being a musician. And what I mean by that is when I'm singing, I learn that I have to think and start Um, that doesn't feel quite right. I'm going to use more air. That one felt good. And I'm going to take my time to warm up, you know, up and down the scale, etc. When I'm conducting, when I'm learning to conduct especially, I have to take the time to work on my gesture. I have to learn a beautiful pattern. I have to learn to breathe on all the beats of the pattern. So that might mean that I sing every day and go, two and three and four and one three and four and one and two four what do these things have in common they're etudes they're studies and i'm learning to take time to be a musician to to build my skills slowly and to practice like a pro and this i didn't make this up but i love it remember that amateurs practice till they get it right and professionals practice till they can't get it wrong. And if you're gonna practice till you can't get it wrong, you've gotta really put the time in. And that doesn't matter whether you're learning an instrument or learning to conduct. It's about preparation. And the preparation takes time. So my advice, get yourself a teacher, a voice teacher, a conducting teacher, take classes that, you love, that, that, that are part of the curriculum and do more than is expected, more than is expected. If you want to make a living as a musician, if you want to be a professional musician, you can't you can't be a professional musician skating by. It's not it's not a career where you can do that. Thank you for your answer. It's very helpful, informative, and I appreciate your time truly. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Next we have Alfred. Tell us about your editorial experience at, and you can pronounce this, 
Pavani or Pavane Music Publishing, where a choral series dedicated to outstanding quality collegiate level music is published under your name. Well, I have to say it's an interesting time to be in music publishing because it's really changed in my lifetime. Um, there was a time where to get your music performed by choirs, it had to be published. It had, it, it had to be picked up by Pavan or G. Shermer or Baron Ryder or one of the companies, Carl Fisher, and they had to actually, you know, put it on plates, publish it on paper, and then you had to buy copies of it. Well, now if I write a piece and I perform it with my choir and people like it, they can email me and say, hey, can you shoot me a PDF of this piece? And I'll be like, yeah, uh, how many copies do you need? And they'll say like, I need 50 copies. And I'll say, okay, well, I charge $2 a piece for 50 copies. Can you Venmo me a hundred bucks? Sure, done. And I send them the piece and then they print it out or they just email it to people and then people put it on their readers and they've got the music. So music publishing is a, a business that's really changing. So that being said, my role at Pavon is to look for repertoire that is appropriate for first class ensembles. Um, choirs like mine, uh, choirs that are professional choirs, choirs at the top level university choirs. Usually my repertoire is all eight parts at least, meaning you know that, that splits into two soprano, two alto, two tenor, two bass parts. And it's hard. Most of the most of the repertoire in my series is hard. Um, you wouldn't want to do it. There, I don't think there's a single piece in my repertoire that would work with a regular high school high school choir. It's all written for collegiate or professional choirs. And so I've looked for a lot of um, people people to um, come and come and talk um, come and talk to my, my student. Uh, sorry, um, come and write for my students. And if they write a piece that I really love. Um, I, I, I will ask them if they'd like it to be published professionally. Um, but now I find that a lot of people who write for my choirs, they don't want to publish their music because if they publish it, they don't get the full percentage of sales. Um, and so that's understandable. So I do think it's changed and I think people have a right to the intellectual copyright on their music that they've written. Um, and if you have a way to get your own music out there, it makes sense to hold on to that copyright and to publish it yourself. Um, if you want a, a music publishing company to send your music out to all the colleges in America for the directors to look at it and to give it away at music festivals and conferences and to, to, to uh, promote you, then you need to be published. So I, I would say to a young composer, try and get three, four, five, six, ten pieces published and then once your name is well known, then um, you can own your own music and, and, and not use a publisher. Did that answer your question, Alfred? It did. Great. We'll, we'll leave it at it did. It, it was a different, uh, it's like a totally different subject than what the other questions are about. Because right. the other questions are focusing on conducting and the choral experience. And this at least veered somewhat to music publishing and what it takes for a conductor to have their music out there. And possibly, I say possibly from how you phrased things, uh, be paid decently. Right. Yeah. Um, it would be really hard to be a full-time composer if you didn't own your own publishing rights. So you look at someone like Jake Renestad, he's 35 years old. He, he owns his own publishing company and he makes all the money off of his pieces. When someone, when someone buys, you know, a hundred copies of something, if it's a $6 score, boom, he's made 600 bucks. If that piece were published with a major company, he would make 10% of that. He would make $60. Well, that you add that up over, you know, 500 universities doing your music. That's the difference between making a living and not making a living. Yeah. Great question. And it is evolving. It's definitely evolving. Um, next, we have uh, Stephanie Sandoval. Good afternoon, Mr. Talbert. Hi, Stephanie. Um, hello. Um, my question is, what does it mean to be a mentor? Like, what is your end result when you're teaching? And also, how do you success success successfully mentor 
pro music musicians. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. I think to be a mentor means to facilitate a student getting from where they are right now to where they believe they want to be. And your job is to facilitate that growth as a mentor. So that means supporting them and loving them and, and being positive, but also being willing to say, you know what, that's not good enough. You're not working hard enough. Um, you have to take responsibility for your own musicianship. You got to practice piano. You got to do. You got to. You got to practice more for your voice lessons. You've got to be more prepared for your conducting lessons. But also at the same time, saying you have what it takes. If they do, if they do have what it takes, you have what it takes to have a career. And I believe in you, and I support you. But the success is on your shoulders. I can't. I can't carry you across that finish line. I can cheer you on, but you have to carry yourself across the finish line. Um, the second part is how do you do it? And I think you do it by building trust and by loving people, by legitimately loving your fellow human beings and, and the art. And I love being, I love being a choir director. And I think it's the greatest career in the world if it's what you want to do. But you have to love it too. And you have to be willing to put the time in. You know, people say, I want, I want to have a career like yours. I'm like, great, start practicing, you know. Start learning choral music, singing. Take your singing real seriously. Learn how this thing works. Learn how the voice works. Not just the art of it, but the science of it. So that you can speak, so you can speak to your lyric soprano and speak to your soubrette soprano and know the difference between what they need to do to make it work in your choir. Those are really important things. Um, so knowledge, you have to have a huge knowledge base to be a great mentor. A good mentor can be a cheerleader, right? A good mentor can say, come on, guys, you got this. You can do it. A great mentor says, come on, guys, you can do it. This is how. This is what you need to know. Thank um, you so much. That's a very good point. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we have a question in the chat from Camilla Antello. Um, I'm going to get to all the questions, hopefully be able to get to all the questions, but I think it's related to what Dr. Talberg just talked about. Camilla, is that what does it should say? What does it mean for you to help out? Yeah. Um. Yes, Dr. Talbert, thank you for being here. My question is, what I what does it mean for you to like help out a student, even though it's similar to what you said in the last question? But what does it mean to like help to like help out if they need help? Well, I, you know, I don't teach music to people. I teach people through music. Okay. I'll say that again. I don't teach music to people. I teach people through music. So my first job is to help out. That is my first job. My first job is to be an educator and, and to, like I keep coming back to the word love. I don't think it's too strong of a word. You have to love your students, all of them. The, the brilliant ones and the ones who don't quite get it. The ones who will do anything for you and the ones who are a pain in your ass. You got to love your students. There's no way around it. Sorry for cussing, <laughs> but you know, and if you do those things and if you find something to love in every student, which every student of mine, I love every student has something that's just really special. It's their grain of them. That's, that's only them, you know, and, and you focus on that, then, then you can help out. Now, Sometimes students need more time than I can give them. And I have to be honest with that. Part of my helping out is to say, hey guys, you don't need me, you need a therapist. Can I walk you student to student counseling? Can I get you into counseling? Because you need counseling. That's also being a good teacher and a good mentor, right? Yeah, um, so I want to say, so sorry. I wanted to, sorry about asking that, but that was my question. Well, I, I, you shouldn't be sorry. That's a great question. Yeah, I, hope I, I hope I answered it well. Yeah, I, I understand now. Great. Thank you, Camilla. Camilla. Um, next, we have um, Anissa. Hello, Dr. Talberg. It's so nice to meet you, and thank you for everything that you've said today. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so my question is, uh, do you have any tips or advice on a student's trans or wanting to transfer to Cal State Long Beach? Um, like how can we best prepare ourselves or how would we, I guess, know we're appropriate candidates in a way? Um, yeah, that's-, that's Those are question. great questions. So first of all, have a plan to get out. 
of your community college. Because, uh, you know, community colleges are great, but if people get comfortable there, they're there four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. You know, have a plan. Give yourself three years. I don't know where you are, but this, if someone came to me and they were starting at college and they were going to go to a community college, which is a great decision. I totally love our community colleges in California. Have a plan to get out. What classes am I taking every semester? And if your counselor can't do that for you, then you need to sit down with a professor and you need to sit down with a catalog and say, these are the classes that I need to get out and, and, and plan that. So that's the first thing that I would say to you. Second thing I would say to you is be honest about where your musicianship skills are and, and have a conversation with your musicianship teachers and say, how do, I, how do I get to where I need to be to transfer to Cal State Long Beach as a junior level musician? Because the idea is that you're supposed to come in and be where our conservatory freshmen were or are two years later, right? So that, that takes a little time um, and, and you might have to really, really work at your musicianship skills depending upon where you are. Obviously, if you wanna do the voice area, you've gotta be singing, you gotta be in choir and you've gotta be, do you have, do you have applied lessons? Uh, like voice, we have, there is a voice class that it's offered. Unfortunately, it's also offered during our like music theory class. So like I need music theory to, you know, but I did take it before I jumped into music theory. So. Okay. So I, I'm going to be honest. I would have a conversation with my department chair about that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a go-getter. So if I see a conflict like that, it doesn't make sense in the, in the schedule. I would actually, as a group of people, go and talk to your department chair and say, Hey, is there any way that we could possibly fix this schedule conflict in future years? I know it's too late for me, but how about the next generation so that people can take theory and voice at the same time? Because I think they should be able to do that, don't you? And Absolutely. So, I would love to do it right now. <laughs> I, believe, I believe in advocacy for yourself. Because sometimes administrators don't even know it's a problem. No one's ever said, hey, you know what? This actually conflicts and slows down my progress at a, at a community college. So don't be afraid to talk. I, I do this all the time, even as a student. Say, hey, what? This doesn't, I'm not sure this makes sense. Can I answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so you much. Audition, you have to sing well and you uh -huh. have to be able to read music. Our transfer students okay. have got to be able to sing well and read music. If you want to be a performance major, you've got to have a beautiful voice. If you want to be a music education major, you've got to sing well and read music. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, just to say a little something a little about Anissa, she definitely is someone that does more than what's expected. So Dr. Talberg, I know that she's going to be singing in your choir one day. Oh, that's great. I love it. <laughs> yes. Looking forward to it. Um, okay, so the next question is Isabel Barriga. Also, if we need Hi. to go a few minutes over, I'm okay, Dr. Cho. I don't know if, if you have to end class right at 3, but if you need to go to 310 or 315, that's fine with me. Oh, that would be amazing. There's, I, I see three more questions in the chat. I really, thank you so much. And if people have to leave, I understand. I know that there's a lot of life going on too, but my next thing is not till 3.30. Thank you. Sure. Um, hi, good afternoon, Dr. Talberg. Um, my question is, how do we make ourselves stand out as musicians and artists? Well, that's another one that's a great question and no one's ever specifically asked me that question in that way. I think that every musician who is a serious practitioner of their craft stands out. I'll say that again. We love musicians who can play instruments well or sing well. And you do stand out if you can do it well. Are you gonna stand out like Beyonce or are you gonna stand out like, um, like Leontine Price? Probably not. And that's okay. That's okay. If you were gonna be Beyonce, you probably would have already been Beyonce, if you know what I mean. But you can stand out by being the best singer that you can be and by practicing. You know, the great thing about community college is it's not too late to have a great career as a musician. You know, lots of people figure it out at community college that they want to be professional singers and they can be professional singers. They've got to, they've got to learn how to, again, how this instrument works and they've got to learn how to read music well, but they can be professional singers. 
and they can be professional educators if they learn how to run a rehearsal, if they learn how to control their body in terms of conducting gesture, if they, if they learn um, the techniques and principles of running a great rehearsal, you can do all those things. My father, God rest his soul, used to say that only 10% of people are really good at what they do. And I hate to say it, but looking over my life, I've found that to be true to some degree. That it's a minority of, how often do you go to the grocery store and find that the checker really is spectacular? He or she is friendly, everything is set, they're great. And when that happens, isn't it wonderful? Or you know, when you have a plumber come out to your house and that plumber, I'm sorry, my mom's phone is going off in the other room. And the plumber says, you need to do this, 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 and this. It's going to cost $275. It will take me four hours and the place will be cleaner when I'm done than when I got here. And you go, all right, do it. I think competency as an artist means controlling your ability to create and having all of, all, like I said, those musicianship skills as a singer, as a, as a, as a pianist, um, or as a conductor, and having a great love of music and having something to say. Um, all artists have something to say. Um, for me this year, a lot of what I've tried to say with my students has, has related to, to the Black Lives Matter movement, to the idea that we have, we have to put voices of color ahead of of other voices right now because they've been pushed down so far. That this isn't the time at my time at Long Beach State to program a lot of music by dead white men. So I'm reaching out and doing other kinds of music, even even in this in this period, music by women, music by black composers, music by Latin American composers, and planning my, my program for next year with those things in mind. I have something to say artistically, and that something to say is that everybody's voice can be beautiful and that we need to hear more than Johann Sebastian Bach. Although I love Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, in my 15 minutes when I'm not talking to you guys, I'll probably turn around and play some Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, but, you know, I, I know what I want to say. And so I think you get the skills up to be able to say it. You know, I've heard it put this way too. Uh, Musical taste without technique is like having great taste in clothing but no money. If you like good clothes and you want to wear good clothes and you want to dress up with good clothes, you've got to have money. If you like great music and you want to make good music and you want to teach people how to be good, musician, good musicians, you've got to have musical technique. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Caesar, are you still here? Yes, hello. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so, so, so happy I got to talk to you. Uh, you're my first professional I've ever got to talk to, so thank you so much. Um, my first question was, what would you recommend for a singer who stacks their air? Like, do you have any exercises or recommendations? Because I, when I'm, you know, singing, I find it just like, I, it's really hard for me to get my air out and in and with between all like you know how the song's going i get very tense just doing that so um is there any advice you have to make it more fluid yeah practice phrase by phrase so um so let let's what what song are you, do you is there a solo song that you're singing right now um i'm only in beginner voice so it's um my country tis of thee so i just keep doing it over and over and over every day so what i would say is you take one one phrase at a time and you just be sure that you're breathing in and going so you go my country tis of the sweet land of liberty of the I sing. Take time to breathe. Land of in and out. Don't do anything between the inhalation of breath and the exhalation of sound except sing. That's the secret to not stacking. Breathe in, breathe out. So just relax a bit. Just take it slower. Try not to like yeah. Be so okay. Test yourself. You practice it and play, and and just take a phrase if you like it. Um, Land of the pilgrim's pride. I don't even remember the words. It's been so long. <laughs> oh my gosh! But take just sing it. Just sing it to yourself and and try it lying down on the floor. Oh, okay. Stack when you're lying down flat. We could talk okay, for a long time. It's hard to <laughs> without actually working with you, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, All right. The secret to not st the secret to not stacking is using the air that you've already got. 
if you use the air that you've got, you won't stack. Oh, I, okay. I see. Okay. So just make sure it's all out. Yeah. Use it out. All, all out. Exactly. Okay. And I had a second question, um, just so I don't get in the way of anybody else, but um, I don't know how shallow it is to ask this, but in the beginner singers that you have encountered, how long did it take to them, for them to find a comfortable space in their voice? You know, it's all dependent upon the beginner singer. Okay. And I will be honest and say that I've had some people in my life where I thought, and this was years ago, because I just never think that way. I, I would think, wow, she is never going to be able to match pitch. This poor girl. Oh my God. How am I going to, how am I going to break it to her that she's not going to be able to sing? And by the end of the semester, she was singing great. And by the end of four years at my high school choir, she was wonderful. So it's just different for everybody. What I would say is, like I said, not everybody's going to be Beyonce. Not everybody's going to be Bryn Terfel, who's a great baritone, classical baritone, but everybody can learn to sing. Okay. All right. Thank you so, 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 so much for your answers. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, can you ask you a question? Yes. Dr. Tolberg, it is such an honor to meet you. I'm new to the world of, of choir, but I've learned so much. And from this interview, I learned a ton. Um, real quick, I also wanted to say, uh, Let Your Love Be Heard that was performed by your choir is one of my, honestly, one of my favorite songs of my entire life. When I heard it the first time, it just blew me away. It was like a religious experience. Um, but uh, yes, my question was, uh, in your journey in music and in building the program at Cal State Long Beach, how were you able to remain steadfast in your goals in the face of setbacks and in dealing with the various personalities one might come across in the field of music? Okay, <laughs> that's a hard question. It's hard because the truth might not be what you would expect me to say. So I'm going to start with the truth. A tablespoon of wine does nothing to a barrel of sewage. But a tablespoon of sewage will destroy a barrel of wine. So if you have a truly negative influence in your program, you have to get rid of them. If they're not going to change, if they're not going to get on board the love train and be supportive and be a team player and take care of people and put the group ahead of themselves, they're not going to fit in to my choir. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to try and get them kicked out of Cal State Long Beach, but I'm going to choose not to work with them if they're a negative influence on people around them. So that's, that's, that's the, the thing that I want to be really direct about. Nobody wants to work with a jerk. And so you have to be a nice person. Um, and if you're not a nice person, I have a lot of grace in me. I forgive and forgive and forgive. But at some point I say, you know what? You shouldn't sing in this choir. And the times when, when we stray from what the Bob choir is and should strive to be are the times when I've given somebody too much grace when they've come to me and said, you know, no, I know, I'm not going to miss rehearsal again. I'm, not, I'm sorry. It's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And eventually I have to say, no, it's just not working. You need to be in a different choir. Um, the other thing is, how do I stay true to it? It comes back down to that great Roger Wagner quote, quote, know what you want and know how to get it. I want my choir to be the pre-professional collegiate choir of choice in California. Eric Whitaker said last year that the Bob Chamber Choir is the gold standard of American college choirs. You know how much that means as a as a choir director? It means so much to hear that um, from composers. And so that means that I have to keep working hard, um, that I have to keep recruiting, that I have to keep going out and doing talks that I love to do, like the one I'm doing with you guys. But, you know, if one or two of you decide to come to Cal State Long Beach, well, the payback for me is spectacular, right? I, I do 15 of these a year. If, if I get one or two people out of those 15 talks a year, look at I'm between 15 and 30 great students for Long Beach State. So I can't ever let myself get lazy. Dr. Talberg, you make me want to go back to school and sing with you and your choir under you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so we have two more questions. Thank you so much for your generosity. Um, the next question, um, uh, I'm going to ask it. It's from James Crumsey. He said, you're fabulous. 
Um, if I could ask my question, what are a few examples of some of your favorite artists and or pieces of music across any genre? Do you miss records or do you prefer the digital era? That's you know, this, this is so funny that you asked this. I had a voice lesson or a conducting lesson with my master's candidate, one of my master's candidates today. And I said, you know, music is the only place where we literally have gone downhill in technology over the last 40 years. The, my, the, the, the stereo that I grew up with in my bedroom at this house at my mom's house was so much better than the iPods I listened to in my condo in Long Beach. Um, I grew up with big giant JBL speakers. I'm not kidding, they were this tall and this wide. I could blow the roof off the house and my father used to get mad at me when I would turn my music up too loud. But if you play um, you know, analog music, if you play vinyl, on a great speaker, it's, a, it's an experience that a lot of you guys have never even had because it's so different than listening to digital music. Um, so yeah, there's a big difference. Do I love the ease of saying, hey Siri, play Beethoven's Fourth Symphony? Yeah, I really do love that ease. And it's made me lazy and I've settled for crappy recording um, technology because of it. Um, what music has con continued to inspire me? Uh, in, I'll give you, I'll go by genres. In the jazz genre, um, the music of Miles Davis has continued to inspire me for, and it always will. I, I just love it. And the music of Herbie Hancock, I love. In reggae, I am an absolute lover of Bob Marley. Um, it, I, I know every Bob Marley song by heart. I just, I just love that music so much. Um, in rock and roll, I'm a child of the 90s. So yeah, I'm a huge, huge U2 fan. And, um, you know, I've seen them in concert many times and um, I, I, I love, I love you too. And, and it's one of my favorite albums. In Crossover, I love Paul Simon. Um, I graduated high school the year the Graceland album came out and I love Graceland. I just think it's one of the greatest albums of all time. Um, and in the classical genre, um, my favorite String music that I listen to, I listen to the Bach cello suites all the time. The it's the the suites for unaccompanied cello by Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, I love the Yo-Yo Ma recordings are, are the ones that I listen to probably most. I listen to the Glenn Gould um, piano variations, um, both the Well Tempered Clavier and um, and the Goldberg variations. I love that music so much. Um, and then in the classical genre. Probably the Rachmaninoff Vespers is my favorite thing to listen to. And my favorite recording of the Rachmaninoff Vespers is on vinyl, actually. It's the USSR chorus singing the Rachmaninoff Vespers. Um, and it's just a spectacular recording. So that's just a little cross section of, of what I listen to. I love so much music and so much new music, too. You're welcome, James. Um, so the last question, um, Randall, I think I saw you still here. Oh, <clears throat> hi. Hello, hi. Dr. Talberg. Thanks so much for coming by. I appreciate your time. Um, I just had kind of like, I guess more like an existential question, I suppose. Um, do you still ex I, or have ever experienced like imposter syndrome when it comes to like your progress in music? And and if you do, if you still do, like how do you how do you get past that? How do you handle things like that? That's a great question. Of course, I've experienced imposter syndrome. Let me um, give you an example of someone of how prevalent imposter syndrome is. Do you all know who Leonard Bernstein was? Do you know that name? He wrote West Side Story. He was the the greatest American composer. If you know this. That, if you know that, or that's Leonard Bernstein, right? Okay. Um, and so he was the conductor of the New York Philharmonic for almost 20 years. And um, one morning his wife comes in and he's in bed. It's nine o'clock, rehearsal's at 10. She says, Lenny, get out of bed. You got rehearsal in an hour. He says, I can't do it. And she says, what? He said, I can't conduct the New York Philharmonic. I don't know this music. And she said, of course you know this music. You've been studying it for five months. And he says, honey, I can't. You have to call them and cancel the rehearsal. I can't do it. She walks over. She rips the covers off of his, she rips the covers off of him lying there in bed. And she looks at him. She says, God damn it. 
You are Leonard Bernstein. Get your ass out of bed and get to rehearsal. I think whoever you are, you are going to have imposter syndrome. You're going to experience, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I don't know this well enough, and I don't have enough talent. All you can do is work harder and do it anyway. If you've worked harder, if you've put the time in, if you've prepared, if you have experienced the music in your brain and you know how it goes, you'll figure out how to get it. So my advice to you, Randall, is accept that you are an imposter. We are all imposters. You know, we are all meat-covered skeletons made out of stardust, acting like humans, right? So go do your thing. Thank you. That's truly inspiring, really. Um, it's an honor to meet you and uh, hear your wise words and, and, you know, all that good stuff. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for a great question. Dr. Talberg, uh, thank you again so much. That was so inspiring. Uh, I took so much notes myself. Um, those of you listening, I'm sure that you probably want to listen to this again to make sure that you don't miss anything. Um, this has been recorded um, and it will be on our Rio Hondo Arts uh, YouTube page. So make sure you uh, check it out. Um, I hope that you know you guys really take to heart all the amazing advice that he gave us. I, I really want to uh, you know type some of your quotes, Dr. Talberg, and print it out and put it all over my our classroom once we get back to campus. That was just awesome, and we really, really thank you. You're welcome. I just gave you my email address and my Insta, so by all means, stay in touch. And um, it's just been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to be here with you all. If you have any questions, don't don't hesitate to email me. I have never had more time to mentor than I have right now. Um, literally, this pandemic is, I mean, normally I have gigs every single week. So, so right now I'm just a college professor, which is a great life. And um, I'm glad to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Thank you. You guys take his offer on it. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. See you all. Have a wonderful, Bye. wonderful day. All righty. Thank you. Have a great